Uh, good morning. It's um, February 22nd, 2013, 7.27 a.m. here on the Pacific uh, Northwest of uh, continental North America, planet Terra. And today's Wujo is going to be basically about small boat guys. It's going to be hopefully really quick. I would have typed up the information, but I have a... Um, a condition of skin cracks, uh, either from uh, bacteria or from too much hand washing, doing dishes and cooking all the time, or from working with all of the dissimilar materials in the uh, <laughs> boat building I'm doing. <laughs> These are nasty, painful little guys, so I just prefer not to type at the moment. Uh, and I'm doing this uh, uh, in an audio fashion. The point uh, was to bring up a couple of real quick issues here and maybe cause a small amount of problems for some really good people. Um, the, there's a real indication in our work that we've got a major earthquake that will uh, maybe impact uh, somewhere in the uh, United States, that is to say the lower part of continental uh, North America. The, the, our data didn't really show that it was going to impact Canada much. And uh, it, it, this pending earthquake that is an interesting one because this one on that we've got a reasonable date for around February 27th, give or take three days each side of that, is not necessarily the one that's going to hit the Pacific Northwest. But it got me that that was um, shown in our um, validation studies of the of Courtney Brown's uh, Farsight.org work, uh, which I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but my point of this was to uh, of this Wujo was to uh, bring up some. Um, uh, notes that I've been uh, gnawing on here and some things I've been doing relative to the idea of the earthquake and the situation around us and it it all relates back to small boat builders <laughs> or small boat people in general uh, but let me um, take a minute and say that I've um, been in contact with Courtney Brown he had me uh, he gave me a call and I was out and I returned the call and we had a nice little chat and he uh, gave me some information that is very pertinent to his position relative to the Farsight.org study. And I need to clarify that he um, he's quite explicit. He hasn't called it off. Uh, he hasn't said it's fulfilled or anything. He was at great pains to let me know that he was saying that the meteor portion of it has been fulfilled in his mind. So... I just simply misunderstood because of the the um, uh, linguistic weight, if you will, that he had placed on the meteor uh, portion. It did appear as though he was saying, oh, well, it's all over. And that's not the case. He's just saying, well, the meteors are, are um, uh, have appeared. Now let's see what else is happening. Now, it is also true that Courtney's position was that the flooding and the tsunamis and so forth were caused by an impact from space and he thinks and uh, because he's a mathematician in an academic environment he has this understanding that deals with the idea of probabilities in a against a background of a, of a supposed assumed neutral universe and so his um, assumption is that probabilistically such a great meteor event as we have had is unlikely to reoccur anytime soon since they, they occur so seldom and I agree with it probabilistically if you think that way the idea of more meteors showing up and causing more damage this year uh, it would be an extremely um, uh, odd situation from a probabilistic view now, from my view of universe, it actually makes more sense that we're going to get more meteors this year than not. Because of the uh, existence of one set of meteors, um, in my view of universe, uh, brings us into a set where the probability actually increases that we'll have... Um, uh, uh, more meteors appear. I don't need to get into all of the details of it, but it's it's sort of like uh, the s three celebrities dying or train wrecks or something. You know, they always come in threes. And so if you have a one train wreck or one airplane crash, you look for the next two in a shorter period of time. And And you can debate me on this, but if you wish to just alter the range of time you're dealing with, statistically, it bears out that uh, th indeed this is a not merely a pattern that is in human consciousness but is a pattern that works out in reality so in any event though Courtney Brown's position is that oh the meteor portion is done and since he had thought that the meteor portion was what was the causal agent of the 
displacement waves and the, the giant uh, onrush of water, then uh, he thought, well, that can't happen and we must be in another timeline. Now, let me note that, uh, you know, Courtney and I disagree and we've agreed to disagree on our uh, basic assumptions as to how universe operates, timelines, etc. And that doesn't really, it's not material, it's not pertinent to this. Uh, but his position um, was that the meteors had caused that. I pointed out a couple of uh, conditions that could uh, fulfill the the descriptions that were given within the farsight.org study, descriptions that would show apparent um, impacts from above that in fact could be originating below, such as the, um, the rupture of a magma pocket uh, causing huge levels of steam which to the people on the surface you wouldn't and if you just drew them you wouldn't be able to tell whether it was a meteor coming down or a giant steam volcano going up. And so uh, he now has uh, widened his position that, well, oh, that there are indeed potential other things that could occur that would cause these displacement waves that would also fit the descriptions that were provided by Farsight.org. And basically, we're all just going to sit around until June, and then we can say, okay, here's what happened and what didn't happen, and, and there you go. So uh, just to clarify then, you know, Courtney is not of the opinion. He did not close down the study. He's not calling off his Farsight.org study. He does not think it has been concluded. Uh, he is merely stating that of all of the number of elements, the meteor one has shown up. And it had been his understanding or his thinking that the meteor was directly related to the inundations. And since uh, you can point out that that's not the case, then, then really all he is saying is, okay, out of all these, you know, X number of, of elements that can be extracted, meteors have shown up. Now, that brings us back to this situation. In discussing uh, uh, the meteor arrival with some uh, friends in Russia and uh, Belarus, uh, I really was keyed to focus in by universe on all of the different kinds of damage that the individuals and, and people and um, animals suffered as a result of that. Uh, but also I'd been thinking about that because Universe prodded me. And so I'd been th thinking about the uh, impact of this pending earthquake that we're going to go through here that was foreseen in the, by here I mean Pacific Northwest, uh, me specifically in the um, uh, western half of uh, uh, Washington State. Uh, we're going to go through an earthquake sometime between now and June 1 that will be very crippling, will cause al all kinds of levels of damage. So uh, I, I know that this is coming and I can say, okay, uh, the, I even in Courtney Brown's viewpoint, uh, the probability of an earthquake is based on any number of factors that we can point to as our area basically being overdue. Now in my viewpoint of the different uh, approach to the universe without, with a single timeline, with, without all of these um, extraneous elements, uh, the earthquake is just an element of uh, related instance, related um, earth effects to whatever it is that causes our global coastal event and causes the inundation. And the earthquake, according to the uh, remote viewing descriptions, uh, that uh, the earthquake area that hits us up in this area is rather severe. Which brings me back to small boat guys. Now, I've uh, been a small boat guy all my life. My father was a small boat guy. I come by this uh, naturally, as my mother says, because her lineage goes all the way back to uh, the Azores and from the Azores up into the uh, Norman region of uh, France and ultimately back into Vikings. <laughs> so we're, you know, we're, we're boat people all the way back. <laughs> anyway, though, so uh, I like small boats. Small boats are really cool, but they bring with them certain challenges. And having, uh, being an old guy and an old small boat guy, um, there's uh, one of these challenges I was thinking about, and that was the basically the care and feeding of people during um, what you can think of as hard time. Hard time being a period of time when you're suffering pain or where you're suffering and you need to look at relief of that suffering and you, as part of a component to the definition of hard time, there is no outside uh, release, no outside rescue. So uh, as a small boat guy, you're always prepared, especially if you go off and you do blue water, uh, like sailing across the Atlantic or something, you're going to be uh, out of contact. This was especially true in the 60s, prior to all of the e perbs and all of the uh, personal beacon identifier things, and uh, the satellite radios, and also prior to money to buy all of that crap. Uh, a lot of people just set out in boats and, <laughs> and went out. And I was one of them, and I would go out with, with uh, different groups that were, you know, experienced at different levels. In any event, though, so um, uh, I was thinking about 
all right, I got an earthquake coming on up that essentially I'm going to look at this from a small boater's perspective. And from a small boat perspective, you, you have various different kinds of trips. And actually, this is how the uh, powers that be through their officialdom grade those people that operate in a marine environment. There's, there's basically two separate paths to captainship, if you will, or skipperdom in, uh, in a professional manner. And they, these two different paths are looking at the vessels that you would potentially skipper in two separate fashions. One is by tonnage. Is it a big bastard? You know, there's all kinds of things that, that uh, skippers of very large vessels need to deal with in a sense of, you know, mass, gravitas, and so on that uh, skippers of smaller vessels do not. Although the principles are the same, the extent of the potential ramifications are far reduced because of the one quarter of energy and all of that kind of business, um, or, or energy reduced to one quarter of the square, etc. Um, the the other issue, the other way of looking at it, is the use in terms of days. So you'll find that there's a whole category of uh, official classification of marine activities that are based on the time you're out on the water. And so there's uh, uh, less than a day charter uh, officialdom rules so that those places that are hotels can uh, es essentially deal with the liability issues and so on of chartering uh, because they are in the charter business if they're out there with these little sunbird boats that they allow you to take out, that sort of thing. And they've got to have certain rules and regulations. Those vessels have to be sound. They've got to have someone who's officially in charge of them. And the, the rules and regulations are relatively minor. And as you scale on up in, in this, you're basically going into in this along this trail, you're in some form of charter captainship. And this would include those skippers that run uh, small mosquito fleets of um, uh, passenger-only ferries, uh, small mail transports that occasionally carry people or uh, animals, all of these kind of things. There's all these different requirements involved from that perspective. Now, this is a different way of looking at things, and it's the small boat perspective. The guys on the big boats are essentially on their own continent. They've got everything in there. They've got refrigerators, TVs, everything they could possibly want. And we won't be in that situation here. We're going to be in the small boat situation relative to how we have to think about the care and feeding of the um, uh, people and, and animals around us after such an event, such as the earthquake or the global coastal event. And so here's, here's the thinking in a small boat fashion. If you're out on a day trip, on a day charter, the likelihood is that if anything happens to any of the people that uh, are in your charge or in your care, you have a, a relatively short period of time and you can be back to uh, infrastructure where they can get uh, necessary medical treatment. So there's a, the concept of less than 12 hours. So even at a day charter, you could find rough conditions, and you might only be technically three hours out of a port, but it might take you 12 hours to get back uh, to cover that same three-hour distance. I've been there. Um, so uh, uh, there's this half-day deal. So there's a certain level of care provided in terms of first aid kits, what you're assumed that you have to have. And this is also based on the number of passengers on the boat and the size of the vessel as well, because that does intrude. Uh, but nonetheless, the thinking is what I want to talk about, and that is the idea of how long before there might be uh, some form of medical assistance. I if you were in a situation where uh, there was a very large earthquake and you had to tend not necessarily to yourself, but maybe to yourself, but also to those people around you, and what kind of injuries would you face? And so our recent experience with the meteor was very il illustrative because most of the injuries uh, fell into one of two categories, and that was lacerations was the huge majority of them, but there were also a few uh, people that suffered, if you will, um, gravity impacts. You know, they were knocked over and they, they had a concussion, broken bone, this sort of thing. There were very few. Uh, from as I understand it, it was less than 10 percent of all of the all of all of the inju injuries were not lacerations. Now, some of the lacerations were quite light, life threatening, and very nasty. And that's a separate issue. But we're talking about um, just the direct cause here, uh, the impact of this, and so. Examining most of the um, injuries I've encountered out on the water as a small boat guy, that's really what it comes down to. There's very few injuries. Um, th there's three categories of injuries that I've had to deal with uh, in 50 some odd years on boats, and those are primarily lacerations, secondarily is burns, and then at a third level is gravity injuries. 
uh, you know, you're either hit by something or, or you fall and hit it, and you have some level of um, damage that way. But of, the, of most of these uh, injuries, they're lacerations and or burns. And then um, uh, perhaps maybe 80 to 90 percent, uh, very few actual falls and, and broken bones and that kind of thing. So um, my primary uh, 